In this third and final video on Norton's theorem, we're going to look at one more example of how we can use the theorem to simplify circuits as we've done in previous examples. Uh, but the example that we see before us here is just slightly more complicated by the fact that we now have two power supplies in the circuit. And you'll see that our output terminals, A and B, are now in the centre of the circuit. So we're going to tackle this problem using the same three steps as we've done previously. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the superposition principle, um, which is hopefully going to help us solve this problem. And the superposition principle allows us to deal with this circuit by just considering one power supply at a time. So first of all, we're going to consider VA, the voltage on the left hand side, and we're going to ignore VB. And then we're going to do the opposite, we'll consider VB and ignore VA. And then we'll superimpose or we'll, we'll add our results together at the end to get the total, um, the total Norton current in this case. So let's have a look first of all at step one of Norton's theorem, which tells us to find the closed circuit current in the circuit. So first of all, to do that, we have to close the circuit. And imagine that we've made a connection between A and B. And that current that flows there is our Norton current. Now, in reality, we've got two power supplies here. We've got our 9-volt uh, cell on the left-hand side, which is going to supply a current through um, from terminal A to terminal B, and there's also a current that emerges from VB, the cell on the right-hand side there, which will also be supplying um, current from A to B. And so what we're going to have to do is deal with these separately and hopefully come to a total um, result at the end. So first of all, let's imagine that we remove VB from our considerations to begin with. And the way we're going to do that is simply just short out that cell. So what I can do is just remove that cell from the circuit and replace it with a short circuit. I'm just imagining there's a wire there in its place. So I'll mark that on there as a short circuit. And now I want to consider the current that flows around this circuit. And we've got to be careful to look at the layout of the circuit, starting from the supply. So if we look at our circuit here, starting from VA, the cell, we have a current that flows through R1. We reach a junction here at the top of the circuit in the middle there. And we have a choice. We can either flow uh, through from terminal A to terminal B through a wire back to the supply or through a resistor back to the supply. Now, we know the old saying that current takes the easiest path. Well, in this case, what's going to happen is because uh, there's a wire here which has zero resistance, we've short-circuited R2. None of the current that emerges from the cell is going to flow through R2 in this case because why would it when it could just flow through a wire here from terminals A to B? So what we'll find is that our current path takes the, the form of uh, going through R1 straight down through A, uh, and B back to the cell here and we have no current flowing this way through R2. So our equation to work out uh, the current in this instance, the Norton current, or at least part of it, is very simple. I'm going to mark it as IN, the Norton current, brackets A. I'll just put a small subscript A there because I'm just dealing with this one cell for now. And we can say that current is voltage divided by resistance, so in this case 9 divided by 120. And that gives me a current of 0 0.075 amps. Well, I can better express that by multiplying by a factor of 1000 uh, and saying that's the same as 75 milliamps. What we're now going to do is the opposite. If we go back to our original diagram here, now we've, we've put uh, VB back into the circuit, we're going to do the opposite and remove VA from the circuit. So I'll do that here 
by just erasing this cell from the circuit. We're just going to, like before, imagine that that cell is just a short circuit. And we're going to repeat the process here and think about the current that's going to flow um, through from A to B caused by the cell on the right hand side VB. So looking at VB we can see that current's going to emerge from the cell it's going to flow this time through R2 and again we reach this point here this junction where current is presented with a choice is it going to flow through a resistor with, an, with a resistance or is it going to throw, th flow through a wire which has zero resistance well in this case all of the current is going to take this path from A to B so again we're left with a fairly simple equation here because we can say that I N in this case I N bracket B because it's the current um, sourced from V B is equal to 6 which is our voltage on the right hand side divided by 270 the only resistor that's uh, in the circuit in this case if I calculate that uh, 6 divided by 270 I get an answer of 22.22 milliamps or 22.22 times 10 to the minus 3 so finally my Norton current is simply the summation or the total of these two separate currents VA on the right hand on the left hand side sorry supplies me with 75 milliamps from terminal A to terminal B and VB on the right hand side supplies me with 22.22 milliamps and so the total current IN or the Norton current is 97.22 97.22 milliamps If I return to the original diagram here, we've completed step one of Norton's theorem, which is to work out the current flowing from terminal A to terminal B, the closed circuit current. Step two of Norton's theorem is to work out the open circuit impedance from terminal A to terminal B. So you'll notice that I've now removed the closed circuit uh, connection that I had between A and B there. It's an open circuit again. And I need to work out the impedance or the resistance starting from terminal A and going through the circuit back to terminal B. So if I have a look at this circuit, first of all, I can simplify things a little bit by just imagining that I've short-circuited both of these supplies. Whenever we're calculating the open, uh, the open circuit impedance, I can just short-circuit any voltage sources that I have there. And starting at terminal A, moving up I immediately come to a junction here and so this junction is where we split and we can either go to the left through R1 and back around to terminal B or go through the right through R2 and back around to terminal B and so because we have two different paths there these two resistors R1 and R2 must be in parallel so what I can say is that the Norton resistance Rn is equal to R1 in parallel with R2 or otherwise uh, 120 in parallel with 270 and those two resistors in parallel come to 83.08 ohms so step one on the previous page was to calculate our total Norton current which was 97.22 milliamps and step two, we've just completed there to work out the open circuit impedance. Step three is to draw our simplified uh, Norton equivalent circuit, which we said was um, a constant current source in parallel with one resistor, like so. And we can mark on the values that we've calculated. We've said that, first of all, from the previous slide there that our Norton current, our total Norton current came to 97.22 milliamps and our Norton resistance which we've just determined there 83.08 ohms so like I said in the previous examples these two circuits are meant to be completely equivalent I can take any measurements across these terminals A and B in either case, 
and I should get the same results for voltage, for current, for impedance. The two circuits should be equivalent. Finally, like we did in our previous example, is we're going to imagine that we are connecting a load to this circuit. At the minute, terminals A and B on, on my simplified Norton equivalent circuit, they're open terminals there. We're going to imagine that we're going to connect a load to this circuit. So let's make some space and use our same diagram again there, but this time let's imagine that we've connected a load resistor across the terminals in this instance, and we're going to call that uh, RL, the load resistor. And let's say that my load resistor has a value of 100 ohms. So I've connected a load resistor there. Now, again, we have a slight problem because we've calculated the supply current. The current that emerges from our current source here is 97.22 milliamps. But because I've added this load resistor in, that current is now going to split. And some of that current is going to flow this way through the 83.08 ohm resistor, our Norton resistor. But some of that current is going to flow through our L, the load resistor. And what we want to do is, like we did in the previous example, we want to consider what is the power that's dissipated in this load resistor. So I'll call that PL, and that's what we're going to try and work out here. Now, if we want to work out the power in the load resistor, we need to know the current in the load resistor. And to do that, we need to use the current divider rule. Just like we did in our last example, we're going to split that 97.22 milliamps into the current that flows just through our load resistor here, and the rest of the current will flow the other way through the 83.08 ohm resistor. So setting up the current divider rule like we did in our last example, we're going to say that IL, the current in the load resistor, is equal to the supply current, which in this case is 97.22, multiplied by a fraction, and like we always do with the current divider rule, whichever current that we are interested in, or whichever resistor that it's flowing through, we always put the opposite resistor on top. So in this case, we're very interested in this current that flows through the load resistor, because that's going to allow us to work out the power. But because I'm interested in this current, I need to put this resistor on top, the opposite resistor. So 83.08 goes on the top of my fraction here and both resistors added together on the bottom. So 83.08 plus 100 on the bottom of the fraction. And if I calculate that, I get a load current of 44.12 milliamps, or 0.04412 amps, but I've expressed that in milliamps there. So finally, I need to work out the power in the load resistor, and the same as last time, we're going to use the formula P equals I squared R, but it's the power in the load resistor, so it's the current through the load resistor that I'm interested in, IL, and it's the resistance of the load resistor, RL, that I'm interested in. So there's our formula there, and we can set that up like so, we can say First of all, we know what I is. We've just worked it out, 44.12 milliamps. So if I'm being correct and expressing that in SI units, I'll say that it's 44.12 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. So 44.12 times 10 to the minus 3. But remember, it's I squared, and so I'm squaring all that in brackets there. Multiplied by RL, which we know is 100. So there's our formula for the power in the load resistor. And as an answer there, I get 0 0.19466 watts as a value of power. But we can do better than that. By multiplying by a factor of 1,000, we can say that that's the same as 194.66 milliwatts. So hopefully this final example of Norton's theorem has been useful to show how Norton's theorem, first of all, can simplify our circuits down to a Norton equivalent circuit consisting of just one constant current source and one resistor in parallel. But then we've gone a little bit further and we've added our load resistor 
in this case, 100 ohms, and we've worked out the current in this load resistor, and finally the power dissipated in this load resistor as well.